Well, good morning. Welcome back to another virtual visit here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. As always, my name is Alex, and today we're going to kind of show you a little bit behind the scenes. We've kind of been on this kick of behind the scenes. In fact, we've been on kind of a kick of lab work, uh, because when we did our behind the scenes tour a few weeks back, uh, folks kind of seem to be interested in our labs. What do they do, right? We've got our central lab. We've got these little side labs. We had tissue storage. So we've kind of decided to dive into those for a few episodes here. Um, now, you previously saw an episode where Taylor and I took a look at water quality. Uh, and we said, you know, they're checking this water quality to make sure there's not too much bacteria in there. There's not too much, uh, you know, uh, germs, bacteria that, like, wouldn't be healthy for the animals, but also wouldn't be healthy for the divers. Uh, and we got a couple questions like, well, how's the, how does it get there, right? Like, why is it there? Uh, and today we're going to take a look at maybe a little aspect of why, why those germs might be there. But we're going to be taking a look at another uh, form of science, another procedure that we do here to make sure our animals are healthy. Of course, before we do that, we always want to thank our sponsors. So Royal Caribbean Group has uh, graciously sponsored this season of our virtual visits, making it so that we can bring these to you live uh, from the Alaska Sea Life Center. And of course, I always want to encourage your participation, right? We have to thank you as the viewer, uh, and we love when you participate. So if you have any questions at all uh, during our, our clip today, you can type in those questions either here on YouTube, or you can text us those questions. We put that number down in the description while we are live, and it's also that number that we popped up at the very beginning. Before we get started with today's uh, program, I actually want to take a look at the sunrise and I was not sure if today's sunrise was going to be any good for this, honestly. As you can see, we were getting a lot of snow right around 8.30. Uh, but there's a couple breaks in the clouds here where you get a gorgeous view out across Resurrection Bay looking out at those mountains there. And so we, we are still getting snow. Uh, when I went and got this camera earlier to pull this time lapse off for you all, it, uh, it was still snowing. Um, and I think it's supposed to kind of snow on and off through the day. So hopefully we don't just get snowed in entirely, but it does provide some really pretty views. And that, of course, is looking out behind the Alaska Sea Life Center out at Resurrection Bay. Oh, this is fun. So we have a question. This is going to lead us right into uh, our, our little clip here. Uh, we got a question from Margaret. When pinnipeds, right, pinnipeds are our fin-footed friends, our seals, our sea lions, walrus would be a pinniped as well. When pinnipeds eat fish, I've always wondered if the bones are digested or if they pass through, maybe you'll cover this today. Eh, it kind of depends on, on what it is, how soft it is, how squishy it is, that sort of thing. But we are indeed going to be looking at what passes through our pinnipeds today. And I'm out in front of our seal habitat. You might see three little seals cruising behind me. We've, got, uh, we've actually got two ring seals in here, Taku and Spencer. And then we've got a little harbor seal named Tuck. And you may have seen some stuff about him on our social media lately. He's adorable. I think everyone kind of has just fallen in love with him. But we're not going to be looking so much at the cute seals today. Uh, we're going to be looking at what they leave behind. So I'm going to warn you, we're looking at seal poop today. Uh, if the title didn't give that away, just, just you know, if you're a little squeamish, we're going to be getting kind of close to it. But uh, let's jump on into that program there and, uh, and show you why uh, we're doing that and what are we learning from it. So here we go. Here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, we like to have as good an image of our animals' health as possible. And for our seals and sea lions, that includes an annual look at their scat. And that's just a fancy word for their poo. This year, three of our seals just didn't feel the need to go to the bathroom during any time when they were hauled out on land. So instead, our staff was going to have to collect it from the bottom of the habitat. Now, of course, if our staff doesn't actually see which of our seals goes to the bathroom and they're all in one habitat together, then how can we tell whose scat is whose? Well, we've got a trick for that. We are collecting fecal samples for our vet staff for our seals yearly checkup, essentially. And because we have these three seals all in the same habitat, um, we're doing this so that we can differentiate whose fecal samples are from who. So each seal has a different color of the glitter and we are stuffing them into their fish that they're eating every day. And then in a few days, we will dive in the habitat and collect samples, hopefully. They just open up and our vet staff um, takes the biodegradable glitter and puts them in. Um, and they're just made out of gelatin. 
So that's why they dissolve so quickly in their digestive system. So this is Taku. Um, so Taku gets the turquoise color, um, glitter pills. Taku is a four-year-old male ringed seal. Um, so yeah, we just stuff them the same way that we stuff like their vitamins every morning. Um, so we take um, the top end of a fish here and I'm just gonna make an opening there where the gills are. Um, and then there is a little pocket there where we will put the little pill. Just like that. Uh, this is a capelin that's just cut in half. Um, just because ring seals are so small, um, we cut their capelin into two pieces. And then I'm just going to make it really clear to our trainers which fish have the glitter pills in them. So they know, just in case another seal would potentially get the wrong fish, they know which fish have the glitter pills in them. This is just their regular checkup, just like how you would take your dog or cat to the vet once a year. Um, they just like to do a fecal sample just to make sure everything's looking good with them. They're getting these twice a day um, and we wait until pretty soon before we're going to feed them to put them into the fish. Um, because the capsules are made of gelatin, they will just fall apart if they sit in the fish for too long. Um, so we wait a good amount of time. Uh, they're thinking around two to three days until we start to see it. Um, could be sooner, could be later than that. We're not really sure. Um, we haven't done this with the seals before, but we have done it with stellar sea lions. Um, and they, for them, it was about three to four days till they saw the results of that. Well, now that they've given those glitter pills to the seals, we of course have to collect up that scat. And, uh, well, we have to do that underwater. So as a diver, it's my lucky day. As it turned out, finding seal scat in the habitat was actually pretty easy. This stuff didn't exactly blend in with the surrounding algae. And of course, when I said it was my lucky day earlier, I really meant it was Chuck's lucky day. Sorry, Chuck, but somebody had to hold the camera. Now, each sample needed to be individually bagged and required a pretty gentle touch just to keep it from disintegrating on the spot. Chuck made neat work of it, though, at least as neat as you could ask any seal scat collection to be, and was able to grab a couple good samples. We popped back up to the surface and handed them off to be taken to our central lab. And that's also where I was headed after our dive to see what science is being done with our seals scat. Okay, so what we're doing now, the next step of the process is to kind of isolate the sample that, we, that was collected and then go through it to see if there's any glitter indicating what animal it came from. And if we can do that, then we need to, we can go further with the uh, fecal analysis. So what I'm doing first is I'm taking our bags of poop that was collected by the divers. And you can see there's a lot of water in there. So my first step that I'm gonna do is try to get all that excess water out, but try not to lose any of my sample in the process. So I have my little colander here that's gonna catch any, any remnants that come out of the bag while I'm draining off the salt water and I'm going to also have our water draining so it can keep it flowing down the drain um, and hopefully it's not too smelly at the same time. So, <laughs> And if you see that we can see some of the glitter in there. If I smash this up a little more, yep, definite glitter flakes in that one. Looks like we may have some gold ones in there. We're trying to decide between turquoise, green, and gold. We have our little glitter pill reference here. Kind of hard to see in the, in the bag itself, but what I can do, since my strainer caught some of them, I can look and see that, yep, yeah, that looks more like the gold. 
So since I see that we have a match, I'm gonna go ahead and divvy out a little chunk into my tube here. I only need about a gram for what I'm gonna do with this. But luckily we have a pretty good sample here even after the water's been drained. So it's about that much that I'm gonna put in there. There we go. And I'm going to indicate on here that I saw gold glitter flakes. So what we got out of these fecal samples, I know I have gold glitter and I also have some green glitter. So that means I got um, two out of the three seals that we needed for fecal analysis for their yearly um, fecal. And we can cross them off our list. And now I'm gonna go on to the next phase of checking to see um, if they have any parasites or any weird, weird um, indicators of anything else in their poop. Parasites are pretty typical for these species seals or sea lions alike, um, because in the wild, they're exposed to them um, in the environment and through their food source. And here we feed them the same food source that they would get out there, just a little different. And uh, they're still exposed to natural seawater that comes into our building through our systems. So they still get exposed to the same thing that they would have in the wild. So we're just trying to check and see that it's not getting out of hand. And if we need to treat them for it to clear them of those parasitic infections, then we can. Okay, so for our fecal analysis, what we like to do is set up um, what's called a direct analysis and then a float analysis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick an applicator stick into the sample in our bag and I'll roll it on the slide like so. It's a fine balance of how much poop you get up on the end because you don't want this too thick on your slide. And then I'll put a few drops of saline on that. I'm just gonna break this up. And that looks pretty good. And now I'm ready to put my cover slip on. Just like so. I'm going to cover this up so it doesn't get dried out while we're doing our float, while we're preparing our float sample. So I have my gold glitter flake tube. And instead of our saline, I'm going to fill it up with our fecosol material. And it, this fecosol material just helps um, eggs that would be in the fecal to um, kind of float up to the top and break away from the, the fecal pellet. looking for any parasite eggs, just in case we need to treat. I'm just gonna break this up really quick. And then fill it more to the top here. I'm gonna do the same thing with our green sample. And while I'm looking at our direct slides, I can go ahead and centrifuge these down, get them running, um, get them started while I'm going ahead and looking at our direct right here. Okay, and for fecals, we spin down for 800 RPMs by 10 minutes. And so we have 10 minutes to look at our directs. And here we go. Yeah, you see a lot of fat cells in there. We see some hair follicles. Um, some clumps of fecal, we see some bacteria in there and that's normal because it, it's poop and it has it in there. <laughs> so there is normal bacteria and we, we just make a note if, 
um, anything's looking crazy or weird or more abundant than it should be. Um, but you can kind of see, you know, like bacteria likes to have this like undulating motion, just like seals have this undulating motion. So we kind of can, we can um, identify them from that and they are either circular or rod shape. So we keep an eye on that and we make note uh, we're also looking at our seals for any parasites ova, which is our main goal through this. And so far, nothing's jumping out, but we're going to keep looking and see if we can find anything. So we have a binder of all our parasite knowledge. Parasitologists in our field are actually um, quite hard to come by at this time. So we try to compile all the information that we have learned from various other resources throughout the years, and this is what we've come up with. We typically look um, for eggs that look like this. So we're looking for a defined um, outer cell wall, and then we're also looking for like a grainy middle, and then anything that, um, any worm-like object in a circular object can indicate a parasite ova. And then also a, a point in that circular object that is essentially the opening or where they would go um, once they're mature enough, get out of that egg. And there's a closer look at that as well. And so what I'm seeing here, and it might be hard to see in this picture, but right here, there is an object that has a defined outer cell wall and I'm going to note that and just kind of continue on my slide um, look just to see um, if there's any more objects like this. This is suspect of an ova egg, but I'm gonna go ahead and go through the whole slide and see if there are any more. So if they do have presence of parasites, you would think that in theory, they should have more than one. And um, so if we see one, then we probably know that there's more than one. Um, but if we see five, then we're going to say, okay, that's a more prevalent um, presence of that parasite in their system. So depending on the number of parasites they have, like depends on how much of a presence that parasite has. I hear my centrifuge screaming at me, so I'm going to go ahead and get these tubes. And what I need to do with these now is I need to fill them a little more with Fecosol and then place a slide on top of them. That way it gives the time for eggs to float up to the top and stick to the slide. But you need to be very gentle and very careful while you're doing this. So I'm going to try to go very slow and just get a little bubble on top. Then a slide. Like so. And now we wait for those to be done. We'll probably wait like 10 minutes or so for those and that will give me some more time to look at the direct slide. And when looking at fecals under the microscope you just want to make sure you're like focusing in and out periodically um, because you can find worms hiding very tedious looking through poop. <laughs> so a, a big thing with parasites too is like some things can look like like fat cells can sometimes get you or like artifact cells from the environment or the water like there's um, algae that can look like something crazy and weird and you're like oh my gosh what is that so like we also go based on like looks but also size and if like the looks and the size match up, we're like, okay, parasite. But it's sometimes it's like, mm, no, pollen. <laughs> and so you gotta, you gotta kind of, it's, like it's like an investigation of what the cell is and does it match up to what you are looking for. And we're basically the Sherlock Holmes of this poop. Trying to find parasites. So I've been seeing 
this object right here. And that looks like um, something artifact from the seawater that I've been sitting in. Um, so whether that's an algae cell or anything like that. So that's stuff you gotta look out for. And if you see something and you're, you say, oh, that's strange, I'm gonna keep note of that and then continue on, then if I see more and then it chained up like this, I know, okay, that's something in the water that was then introduced to the sample, not part of the sample. Okay, we've come to the end of our direct slide. So now we need to move on to our float. And then I'm gonna make, it's gonna line up our gold sample with our other gold sample. So I'm just gonna pick this slide off the top of the tube and put that on. And we'll look at this one under the microscope. This one will look a little bit different, not as crowded. Not as crowded with all of these, all this matter that's going on, but it will look a little more clear with just a few floating objects in there. And that's what we want to see. We want kind of all the clutter cleaned out and more of isolated cells such as ova eggs or anything of that sort. And typically in your float, since it is so clear and not as crowded, it's a little easier to spot eggs. And I'm not seeing anything, and we're at the end of the slide. So that is a really good sign. These annual fecal exams may seem an undignified task to some. After all, most folks likely don't enjoy picking up animal poo, let alone smearing it around and getting an up-close look at it. But this important process is key to monitoring and maintaining the health of the amazing animals we have here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. All right, well, that was quite the procedure. Uh, and it was super exciting to be able to, to see all these aspects of it. It's something I hadn't really uh, seen done here. It's something, of course, done pretty much one time annually as we're, we're looking at the health of our animals. But this year, we got to take that extra step of actually adding the, uh, the sparkle, right? Uh, make, making it a little, a little shinier, a little glitzier. Um, but it looks like we've actually got some, some questions here. Taylor's been kind of monitoring. So Taylor, yeah. what's that? Yeah, so we have a question. And the message says, Natalie mentioned the word artifact. Now, what does that mean? Right, so Natalie says like, oh, this looks like maybe more of an artifact in the stat. Uh, and that might bring to mind like Indiana Jones, right? But Natalie, of course, alluded more to Sherlock Holmes in the investigation. Uh, but with the artifact, we're just talking about something that isn't actually from the stat sample. Um, it could be, you know, something from the water itself, or, you know, we do occasionally get these samples from land, not just in the water, uh, and they'll pick up, you know, gravel and grit and hairs, uh, or like clothing fibers of, of the people collecting it, that sort of thing. Um, so an artifact is just something not, not from the seal, not something we're uh, going to count as being in that stat sample itself. Uh, another question? Yeah. So what do you do if you find an actual parasite? All right, so there was that one egg, uh, or, or what we thought might be an egg, right? And uh, we just kind of found the one. Uh, and Natalie did say, you know, if you find one, you, you might expect to find more. Um, and really, we're looking at the, the abundance. Uh, and so if we do determine that one of the seals has a parasite, we're going to have to treat them. Uh, and we've got, you know, various uh, medicines that we can use to do that. But if, you know, if two of the three seals turn out clean and one of them turns out to, to, to have that parasite, we're still going to treat. We're still going to give a treatment to all three uh, just because they do share that space. Uh, they're swimming around. It's water. Water's kind of a weird place to live if you're worried about parasites. Because, I mean, here, you know, walking around, you might get parasites if you brush up against something. Or if you're walking around barefoot, you could get something uh, through contact that way. Maybe if you're eating, you know, something that has been uh, processed probably. But you pretty much have to bring those parasites to you. For animals that live in the water, right, the parasites can come to them. Uh, so if, if one of the seals you know, is determined to have a parasite, 
uh, or, or uh, an infection, we will treat all three of those seals. That's a great question. Are there any more? All right. Yeah, so this one's actually my question. Okay. As I was watching you edit these videos and everything, I couldn't help but wonder, did it smell bad? It, it smelled bad. I mean, it's, it's quite a process, right? Uh, and and I'll, you know, I'll pull up just a little footage just to remind people, like, there's a lot of steps to this. And Natalie did mention when you're mashing up the scat, that can kind of uh, smell pretty bad. But when we were in the lab there, it actually didn't, it didn't smell that bad. Um, now, we were doing these very small samples of scat, uh, you know, and, and pouring out the water, and it was all, that, that was getting washed away right away. Um, so it didn't really smell bad. But I have been around for larger um, scat programs, actually a, a different process entirely looking at sea lion scat uh, to determine their diet. Uh, and that, that can smell uh, kind of rank, uh, especially you're working with a lot of it. If you're working with a lot of it in this enclosed space and you're, you're spraying it down to try and get it clean, which seems a, a strange concept to clean the scat, um, that definitely can have a scent. But these seals, it wasn't too bad in that lab, honestly. Uh, and I guess that brings us back to, to Margaret's question at the beginning. I don't think we have anything else texted in right now, and I'm looking at the YouTube chat. Uh, and Margaret asked, are the bones digested as they pass through? Um, and we didn't see a lot in the, in the scat there, but we weren't really looking for bones. We were looking for this glitter. But there was kind of a grit, a graveliness to the scat. And that, you know, a lot of times is uh, a bone fragment or sometimes whole bones. Uh, and I mentioned we do look at sea lion scat. We actually look at wild sea lion scat. And in that, we can find bones and scales. And that lets us identify, you know, the diet items of these animals. We can actually identify the species of fish that the seals or sea lions out in the wild are eating if we're looking at their scat. And that's because it leaves behind these telltale bones. Uh, and it, it's kind of like if you've ever done uh, owl pellets in school. You might have done this owl bolus where an owl goes out and it eats shrews and mice and that sort of thing and then it hacks up like this hairball. Uh, and schools can actually purchase these in bulk and you dissect them and you can find the, the bones of the food that that owl ate. We're kind of doing the same thing with wild sea lions, uh, only it's, it's out of a sea lion and it's out of the opposite end of a sea lion, but we can determine the diet. It looks like we got another question in. Have you ever had a seal with a parasite? So as I was mentioned, yeah, you know, we are bringing in water from the bay. So they are getting water from the ocean. We do have filters. We've got ways of sterilizing this water. But stuff can make it through. And uh, you know, we have had animals that we've had to treat before. Uh, another big one is if we get in an animal through wildlife response, uh, where it just straight up came in from the wild, we definitely have to treat those animals in a lot of cases. Uh, and so you know, we're looking for things that you might look for in your cat or your dog, we're looking for like worms. Uh, of course, they would be different types of worms, but most of it's just looking for worms, and we, we have had to treat animals before. Uh, Margaret asked another question here. I bet it smells like fish. I suppose it probably does. It's not, it's not like that fishy, like if you go down to a dock uh, and, 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 uh, and dig around uh, down by a dock or just hang out while folks are fishing. It's not quite that fish smell, but it is kind of, yeah, a, a funky fishy smell. Um, and uh, Margaret also notes, if you walk underneath a great blue heron rookery, that would be amazing to do. Uh, like we have here in Seattle, it smells very strongly of fish. I could see that, yeah. Out in the aviary here, we do get uh, kind of like an ammonia smell from a lot of the, uh, the, the guano, the, the, the bird uh, waste out there. But uh, it's pretty fishy out there as well. Another question, looks like. Actually, not a question, okay. but just a thank you. Oh. We have someone really saying that it's been really interesting to understand these lab procedures. Good. It's so cool. So just a thank you. Yeah, no, we are, like, this is really exciting to me uh, because it's, it's a fun opportunity for us as educators to actually get back there and say, hey, can we just follow this whole procedure? And, of course, as a diver, I was able to be involved a little bit, although Chuck did the, Chuck did the heavy lifting uh, there. But it's, it's fun to learn these, and it's really fun to share them. So I'm glad there's folks out there that are uh, enjoying our little series of lab work here. And uh, we've actually got some more coming up. Taylor's been working back in the lab, uh, following some procedures back there. So we'll have more coming up. Uh, and of course, we're always doing these virtual visits Wednesday at 11 Alaska time. And we hope that you'll tune in for our future programs. But before we go, we want to thank our sponsor, of course, Royal Caribbean Group. Uh, and they make it so that we can actually get these out there free for the public to watch. And that's uh, just been a joy to be able to actually just bring everything we do uh, behind the scenes and out on the floor and bring it out to folks online for free. So thank you, Royal Caribbean Group, for sponsoring that. 
And with that, I think we're probably going to wrap up our program. Doesn't look like we have any more questions, but I want to thank you for joining us for another virtual visit, and I hope we'll see you in the future. So long.